The electroencephalogram, or EEG, allows us to monitor the electrical activity of the brain. As far back as the 1930s, researchers suggested that the EEG could be used to monitor the depth of anesthesia. At that time, the approach to reading the EEG was to look at the electrical waveforms and decipher what the specific patterns meant given the clinical context. Unfortunately, this approach to reading the unprocessed EEG never caught on as a standard practice in anesthesiology, perhaps because the mechanisms and relationships to anesthetic brain states were unclear. In addition, some people may have felt that the anesthesia EEG waveforms were too complicated to interpret. By the 1990s, there was a push towards simplifying interpretation of the EEG. What resulted was the development of algorithms to distill the raw EEG waveform into a numerical index, or single number, typically between 0 and 100, designed to indicate how unconscious the patient is. While these indices did allow anesthesiologists to use EEG-based information to assist in determining what was going on in the brain during anesthesia, they did have some widely recognized issues. As a result of these problems, the EEG indices also failed to become a part of routine anesthesiology practice. Recognized issues with the indices include they are often slow to respond to changes in the patient's state. Some drugs, such as ketamine, nitrous oxide, and dexmedetomidine, seem to give the indices problems. It is unclear if we can reliably use them in pediatric populations, and the indices may not work appropriately in elderly patients. One of the main reasons the indices had so many problems was that they were constructed at a time when we did not clearly understand the science of what was occurring in the brain during anesthesia. As a result, the indices tended to go against the fundamental approach taken when monitoring most other physiological signals. For other physiological monitors, we typically have an understanding of the linkage between the signal and underlying physiology. The anesthesia indices were developed in a time where we were still trying to establish this linkage between the EEG signal and the anesthetic action on the brain. We now have a much better understanding of the science and neurological underpinnings of anesthesia. As such, why should our current brain monitoring approaches remain mired in the past? We have a very rich signal in the EEG waveform that can provide us with valuable information about the state of the brain. Why lose all this useful information by only using an index value? Consider the electrocardiogram. Clinicians use this waveform all the time. With proper training, we can understand the morphology associated with the ECG waveform and how it relates back to the underlying physiology of the heart. We know that specific ECG waveforms indicate aberrations in how particular areas of the heart are performing. The ECG signal shows us real-time information about the heart's current state, allowing us to precisely intervene if necessary. Why not use the EEG signal in a similar manner for anesthesia monitoring? During general anesthesia, there are highly structured patterns within the EEG waveform. These patterns relate to different states of altered arousal. Furthermore, we can relate these patterns to the physiological actions of different anesthetics on specific molecular targets in specific neural circuits. Just like the case of the ECG, you just have to learn what these patterns are, and after a time, it becomes second nature. The fine structure of the EEG waveform does make it a bit more of a challenge to decipher when compared to the ECG waveform. The typical EEG waveform patterns for general anesthesia with different anesthetics can look vaguely similar to one another, especially when scrolling by on the EEG monitor. Luckily, we can view the same waveform in a different way to profoundly highlight the distinct differences between the EEG signals. This is the same EEG signal just mathematically translated to indicate the frequency content of the signal, creating what is called a spectrogram. Looking at the spectrogram, each drug can appear visually distinct from one another, which makes sense because we know they act through different mechanisms to induce anesthesia. As it turns out, 
the EEG signal may not be too hard to visually decipher, especially considering that several current brain monitors are capable of displaying this spectrogram in addition to the EEG waveforms. Other videos in this series and the associated CME course will explore several common anesthetics and how we can use the EEG waveform and spectrogram to recognize different levels of consciousness. With real-time measures of brain activity, we believe anesthesia care providers can deliver a more personalized form of anesthesia care that is tailored to an individual patient's specific drug responses.